everyone. Welcome to this session about serverless. And uh, let's see how silly we can get, or at least somewhat funny. Uh, I'm Guillaume Laforge. I'm a developer advocate for Google Cloud Platform. And you are? Uh, my name is Brett McGowan. I am also a developer advocate on Google Cloud Platform, focusing on serverless. Super happy to be here at DevOps. I live in New York City, but I have to tell you, I'm from Texas. <laughs> All right, much better. So I guess that's the beginning of the silliness of our <laughs> of our talk. Thank you. All right. Um, so a little a little bit of uh, buzzword status alert. So it's not silly, which is the buzzword of the day, but it's going to be serverless. Uh, serverless. Uh, it's something that we've heard of uh, in 2015. Uh, although, um, so you see the the nice trend uh, going upward. But it's not really something new. And actually, uh, back in the, the, the old days of the caveman where you were handling your own infrastructure, provisioning servers, etc., uh, we've come a long way from that. But already in 2008, um, Google released Google App Engine, uh, which was the, the, the pioneer in terms of serverless uh, because it was the PaaS uh, platform as a service uh, infrastructure, which was... Uh, provided by Google, and the unit of deployment was an application. You were deploying applications. You didn't have to care about scaling, about provisioning servers, your infrastructure. You didn't have to operate it or anything of that kind. And on a regular basis, we released uh, different serverless solutions or managed services, as we might have called them back in the day. For example, BigQuery, we'll do a demo about that, which is a, uh, an analytics data warehouse platform, cloud storage for storing all kinds of uh, objects, files, uh, etc. Cloud Data Store, uh, an early uh, NoSQL uh, data store. Cloud Data Flow, uh, if you want to uh, filter your data, create pipelines of data and do all sorts of uh, analysis on that. Um, we acquired Firebase, um, which is a great solution for developing web, mobile applications on a backend as a service. Uh, Cloud PubSub for all the your, your messaging fabric, so you've got topics and you exchange messages uh, all around. And last year, uh, we announced Cloud Functions, uh, which is going to be a big uh, aspect of this talk. And uh, Cloud Machine Learning Engine to uh, run uh, machine learning training uh, prediction uh, in the client directly as a service, and the uh, Firestore, uh, which is the new uh, real-time database, NoSQL database for uh, Firebase. And, uh, yeah. So what is serverless? So serverless, I think the, the explanation, it's in the name, right? Obviously, uh, it is code that runs without any servers. There are actually no servers at all. So I'm very excited to show you an exclusive look uh, into Google Cloud Platform's dedicated serverless data center. So this is what it looks like on in the inside. Your code runs in there somewhere. <laughs> uh, no, just kidding. Obviously, this is not our serverless data center. Uh, serverless, there are servers. It's just who's managing them, who's running them, um, and are you worrying about them? That's the difference sort of fundamentally between serverless and not serverless, but we'll dive a little bit more into what that means. And let's start with an example. So I'm going to build an application, and we'll start with a pretty typical application where I have some app, maybe a mobile device, a website. It's going to submit a photo of me to uh, to my app, and it's going to make a cartoon out of it, right? So um, here we've got me. I think I'm actually wearing this exact same uh, outfit right now. So this is not live. <laughs> this is not running. Um, but this is a pretty simple diagram. But you can see already that the simplicity is a bit deceiving because I'm not just managing the code that turns me into a cartoon. I'm also managing these other things. I have to know what version of operating system I'm running. If there are new security updates, I have to update them or someone on my team has to update them. I have to worry about networking. Even in this example, can my server that's running my cartoon code, can it get to the internet? Can people on the internet get to it? What happens if that connectivity goes down? It's all things you're worrying about. What web server am I running? What version of that is compatible with the libraries that I have to install? And I have to manage those. So it's a lot of work, even for a pretty basic application. And even if you as a developer aren't worrying about this, someone on your team, someone somewhere is, um, it, it can get complicated deceptively uh, pretty quickly. But now let's say our cartoon app becomes super popular and we actually need to scale up because it's more than one machine can handle. So we have introduced three more servers and 
not only do we already have the same problem with each of those servers managing and, and deploying an update, but we've got a few, few other problems to worry about. For example, are all of these servers running the same version of the operating system? Are they all running the same version of our application? And there are tools to help us with this, like Puppet and Chef, but it can get complicated pretty quickly. And those are all things that still rules that have to be written and processes that have to be created. So uh, my cartoon is starting to look a little bit sad about this already because I just want to worry about this cool cartoon app that I'm building. I don't want to have to worry about all this other stuff. Also, uh, I have to come up with a load balancer to sit in front of all of this, right? My, my app doesn't talk to the web server directly anymore. There's something that sits in between. But now we get more, really get really popular and we have to scale up uh, beyond even three virtual machines. So as traffic increases and continues to increase, we could just add virtual machines and add VMs and add VMs to infinity, but there starts to be a budget constraint um, where we just don't want to scale to infinity. So we want to cap it, but we also don't want to lose requests. So a common architectural program, uh, uh, paradigm will be to have a messaging queue or a queue that sits in front of it and absorbs all these spikes and requests. So as you have sort of this uneven traffic pattern, as it ebbs and flows, your queue absorbs all those requests. So it gives you time to, to spin up and spin down virtual machines on the back end as your load changes. But again, this is still a lot of stuff that we have to worry about, when at the end of the day, we just want to worry about what is delivering business value, which obviously is always cartoons. <laughs> Um, so this is the dream, right? The dream is I just have code and it runs and I don't have to worry about any of that. So I won't tell you that we're there yet, but that's the philosophy and that's where we're headed. Because then, this is when we break dance. This is, this is the quality story of serverless. So a little bit more concretely, what are some of the principles around serverless? So I think there are a few. One, uh, kind of in the name that we talked about, no need to manage or even think about servers. How many do I have? What versions of the OS? How is the load balancing? How does the networking work? Um, those are all abstracted away, and the cloud provider takes care of those for you. Um, this is key. You don't explicitly provision. So if I'm going to launch a new service or a new application, I don't have to guess, am I going to have 10 users, 1,000, or 10,000? If I get this tech crunch of effect where my startup is on the front page and I just get overwhelmed with traffic, and now the, my first impression to all of my potential users is that my app is down or that it doesn't work because I didn't guess correctly how much traffic I would need. We want something that scales up automatically um, and you don't have to explicitly provision. And then also pay per use, which is very different. I'll talk about that in a second. And then finally, uh, serverless is often stateless or ephemeral, which means if you have state that you need to save, you don't store it in your application anymore, but you actually need to store it outside in something dedicated like a database or a distributed or a cloud file system. It doesn't live in your app anymore. So pay per use is interesting. Um, so it's, I think sometimes people think... Uh, Serverless is similar to cloud in that I only pay for the services that I use, right? But in serverless, you literally only pay when your code is actually executing. So if your request finishes, you don't pay anything. So back to that uneven traffic spike that I was showing earlier, uh, in the downtimes, uh, your cost is literally zero if there are no requests coming in. And you can kind of do this a bit uh, in a cloud virtual machine world, but you have to be responsible for monitoring your traffic, and you have to explicitly create and delete those virtual machines as they come in. So I had those sort of four principles of serverless, but for me personally, I like to boil them down into two overriding principles. Like, what does it mean for something to be serverless? And that has, in, so I consider it to be one, it's invisible, auto-scaling infrastructure. So you just aren't thinking about it and you aren't worrying about it. And two, you aren't paying for unused CPU cycles. So for me, if you're using a service or a product that conforms to this, then yeah, it can be part of a serverless application. So let's delve a little bit more into specific examples of serverless tools. So there are two categories, generally speaking, of serverless. One is backend as a service. And the idea here is if you're building an application and there already exists a service that does what you want to do, it oftentimes makes a lot of sense to consume it. So email is a great example. You could create your own servers, your own virtual machines. You can install an SFTP server. You could 
get whitelisted with ISPs. You could worry about being in the correct geo, geo, geo region to handle all the, the email routing and all that. Or you could just sign up for a service like SendGrid or MailGrid, Gun, right? And you sort of outsource that bit of your application. And there are a whole bunch of these. So from the serverless databases to doing SMS, um, you can use something like Twilio. Um, you can use Auth0 for authentication. And so these are different than software as a service, which you tend to consume directly as a user. But these are backends of the service that you actually integrate into to your application, right? So it's some core component of your app that actually runs outside of your application. Uh, it's hosted elsewhere. And then the other type of, of uh, serverless is, as we all know, is called not yet a service as a service or NASAS, right? I see a lot of blank looks. <laughs> okay, fine. This is often called functions as a service or FAAS. But the reason I like to use the term not yet a service as a service is because if you want to do something in your application, tend to use to try to use something on the on the left side of the screen, right? Something that's already out of the box. It box it exists. Um, if it's not your core like business competency, but if it doesn't exist as a service, you can actually use functions as a service to sort of create it as a service for either external users or oftentimes just for other users and teams within your application. They're actually consuming this new thing you created as a service, just like they would consume one of these others. So if you have some prediction service or some pricing service or something like that, uh, it functions as a service makes it really easy to deploy it because you don't have all the overhead, like we saw in the first few diagrams of managing operating systems and deployments and all that. So it makes it really, really easy to build a function as a service. Um, I tried to get hashtag Nyasas trending on Twitter. Um, <laughs> it is not going well. It's because you I'm in help. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you tweet hashtag Nyasas, I have some stickers up here, Google Cloud and Cloud Function stickers. So, so help me out here and we'll get it trending. But there's a reason I'm an engineer and not in marketing. Uh, <laughs> apparently serverless or functions as a service yeah. is way well, catchier yeah. Yeah, than Nyasas. So anyway, uh, Guillaume, you want to give us a little bit of a deep yeah, dive into... Functions as a service? Actually, initially, I thought uh, the, the end on why was because you were in the New York office in the, in the Google office. Right. Well, I wanted no, to call it Brett as a service. Brett as a service but would have been nice. It well. made even less sense. Yeah. So let's focus on functions as a service and uh, in particular, a product called Cloud Functions, which is part of the Google Cloud platform. Uh, so it's a Node.js based environment, uh, at least currently, but other languages will be uh, coming soon, uh, including perhaps... Oh, come <laughs> on. I was thinking of Java, something like this. <laughs> but, you know, as soon as uh, Java is supported, any other alternative languages like Apache Groovy <laughs> will be supported. Uh, anyway, so currently uh, you write your code in JavaScript and Node.js. Uh, so it's a serverless environment uh, to build and basically connect cloud services with code together. For me, that's kind of, it's a, it's a glue to connect things together. Think about it uh, like this. So you've got various microservices together, uh, and you can glue them together uh, thanks to uh, this uh, fabric. Um, they are um, so. If you look back at the principles that Brett uh, mentioned, uh, there are no server management whatsoever. So you don't have to provision your infrastructure, uh, create clusters, uh, ask for machines or VM or anything of that kind. Uh, it automatically scales for you. So if there's zero user, there's going to be nothing running. Uh, but if you've got thousands of uh, cartoon uh, fans uh, going crazy uh, generating cartoons, then uh, we'll be able to create as many functions, uh, instances of functions as needed to handle uh, the request for uh, making new nice uh, cartoons. And uh, as it scales up and down, zero or to infinity and beyond, uh, you only pay for what you use. So if there's 10 users, it's going to be proportional to the number of users, basically, no, no number of invocation calls. Uh, 10 users, it's going to be a, a fraction of uh, some sense. But if it's uh, 1 million uh, users, it might be a few, I don't know, I, I never remember the, the, the amount, but it's, uh, it's going to be a few bucks. Something well, like technically, this. there's two million invocations a month oh, yeah, for free on cloud functions, that, yeah. so it'd be zero for your first zero, two zero. million. Yeah. So uh, you, you still have time, you know, to be famous and have a popular website generating cartoons, and then uh, after the first two million invocations, yeah, you're going to have to pay some cents or dollars. Um, 
there are uh, different types of cloud functions. There are basically two categories. Uh, so purely asynchronous functions and uh, directly synchronous invocable functions. Uh, so the first uh, ones, uh, the first one reacts to, for example, cloud storage events. So as soon as you upload a picture uh, of yourself on, on this cartoon service or application, uh, then the, your function is going to be triggered. Uh, another example is if you, in your um, on, on your platform you're going to you're, you're going to use the uh, cloud plug sub service to do uh, the messaging. Uh, each time there's going to be some kind of message that appears on a queue on a topic. Uh, then again you're going to be able to invoke a cloud function and the synchronous uh, functions uh, with HTTPS uh, you actually already uh, have uh, for, for you if you declare your functions to be uh, uh, triggered by uh, via, via HTTPS you're going to have a URL for uh, your function so anything uh, that can call uh, a URL uh, basically will be able to invoke your function synchronously. Cloud functions use cases let me highlight a few uh, interesting use cases. Um, if you, uh, those who are using something like GitHub, for example, are certainly familiar with that, with webhooks, uh, you can tell and instruct GitHub to ping a URL uh, of your own uh, if something happens. So for example, let's say someone starred uh, the open source uh, repository of your cartoon generator, then perhaps you want to tweet something about it. Yeah, one more star on our you know, account. Uh, so you may have a function that reacts to this call made from GitHub as soon as someone stars uh, your repository. Another uh, aspect, uh, if you have some small APIs, for example, you want to expose quickly uh, some logic uh, so that people can can call your your, your service, uh, you can expose uh, a cloud function uh, just because you know with the when you expose it via the uh, HTTPS uh, trigger, uh, then you have a URL to call. So you don't need any other additional service like a gateway or something like this. Your functions are uh, invocable very uh, easily and quickly. Um, Let's say you have uh, perhaps invoices coming up or some kind of uh, files that are coming up that you store on Google Cloud Storage and perhaps you need to uh, extract some metadata, for example, the, the amounts uh, the, the, the the amount of the, the, the invoice or something like that. And then you want to store that kind of information in a data store. So again, uh, you could use uh, functions to be a kind of lightweight uh, extraction uh, tool uh, solution. Another popular topic these days, it's IoT. Uh, let's say uh, you have tons of uh, devices, like you push a button and it's going to generate a picture, a cartoon or something. So let's say each time, each, uh, each time someone uh, hits uh, that button, or let's say you've got various sensors, temperature, temperature sen sen sensors, not sure how temperature is related to cartoons, but <laughs> bear with me. Uh, then perhaps you're going to uh, send some event and then you're going to invoke uh, a function. A uh, little bit similar to this idea of webhooks I mentioned with GitHub, uh, if you have a complex infrastructure hosted on the cloud and you want to react to things like uh, perhaps you build some Docker container, uh, some, you know, uh, the, the various bits and pieces of your infrastructure, you can also use cloud functions to asynchronously react to the changes in your infrastructure, uh, to, you know, plug into your CI, CD pipeline, all that kind of things. Functions are a great uh, solution for reacting to such events. And basically, it's quite simple. So let's look at this uh, little example here. It's basically just three lines of code. You just export a JavaScript function, and then you can, well, this one, it's a, an HTTP, uh, HTTPS function. Uh, so we're just going to uh, handle the what's coming out in the in the request and on the output, the response, we're going to send uh, something out. And you've got the uh, HTTPS endpoint available uh, the auto automatically with a, a secured connection because of uh, SSL TLS and that's going to scale automatically as you have more uh, users coming up and with sub-second billing, wow, that's uh, pretty cool. And your URL is ready, your function is deployed, you just, uh, you know, hit the, uh, the, the function from your browser, it's uh, fairly straightforward. So, 
we showed the code, but how do you actually deploy that little function? Well, there are different mechanisms. Uh, first of all, you can use the Google Cloud Console UI. Uh, from there, in the uh, functions, Cloud Function section, uh, you can upload your code directly uh, by writing code in an inline editor with syntax highlighting, etc. So it's not really an ID, but at least uh, for simple functions, it gets the, the job done. But you can also upload uh, the, the, the code of your functions of your uh, Node.js project uh, with a zip file, or you can also point to a Git repository uh, in order, I mean, to each, you know, developers usually uh, use uh, some kind of uh, um, uh, distributed uh, version system, control system, etc. Uh, it's, it's a best practice rather than coding directly uh, within the UI. So these are the way you can uh, configure things from the uh, console UI, or you can also use the gcloud SDK, which is a command line tool, which allows you to deploy things from the command line. And another, another uh, kind of deployment, uh, it's a local deployment. We also have a local emulator. It's a node module that you can install on your machine, um, which allows you to run the function directly on your machine. Why do that? So deploying cloud functions, it's quite fast, right? So uh, it's not going to, you you know, you're, you're not going to uh, you know, spend an hour waiting for a function to be deployed. So it's pretty fast, uh, a few seconds to one or two minutes maximum. Uh, but when you're developing, you want to see changes live. And uh, if you use the emulator, actually, there's live reloading taking uh, in, in action, basically. Uh, so you, as, as soon as you make a change, you're going to see the changes live uh, uh, in in uh, yeah running uh, taking taken into account the other cool aspect of the local emulator is the the debugging uh, capabilities uh, so you can plug uh, like the Chrome Dev tools or any uh, IDE to do you know the usual uh, debugging uh, sessions and go step through your code etc. The fact that Cloud Function is the kind of managed uh, environment, um, you also benefit from the other services which are part of that platform. So for example, there's uh, the, the stack driver uh, logging and uh, error tracking uh, solution that's built in into the, uh, the Google Cloud Platform. So in your code, you might have some console log statements. Then those statements will be collected and uh, be available via the, uh, the console UI. If there are some uncode exceptions, you didn't handle something, you will also be able to see what was going on. Uh, something I mentioned about the logs is that you can also see from the console the logs related to one particular invocation. So you, you, you don't have to search, okay, where was my function actually called in, in all those traces that I have? Now you can also see per invocation, just the logs for that particular invocation. And then with those logs, you can do, you can access them uh, on the common line the, via the, the, the UI or the REST API, or you could also export that to BigQuery. We'll mention BigQuery later on to do some further uh, analysis. We also have monitoring going on, so you can uh, look at the invocation count of your functions, you can look at the execution time of your functions, and things like memory usage to see how your overall application uh, is performing with all those uh, little functions going on. Sometimes, so we, uh, in introduction, um, we mentioned uh, App Engine as being kind of like the, the pioneer in uh, serverless um, solutions. Um, sometimes what I'm seeing uh, with customers, developers, etc., is that uh, sometimes developers write big, fat functions. I don't know how can we, is there a term for, you know, monolith, but the, the function monolith or something, I don't know. Uh, sometimes I see people, you know, oh yeah, let's, we can deploy functions. I'll be, uh, I'll build a full app in a, inside one function. Well, it's not exactly how it's supposed to be used. We'd better, you know, decouple that into smaller functions. And sometimes, uh, and I, I'm guilty of that myself, well, I don't have to be ashamed of that, but uh, I used to be using App Engine for small services, which were... I mean, in terms of scope or business logic, it was small enough that it could be just a function. So what's the, you know, how to choose from a pass versus a fast? Sometimes, at least my take, my rule of them is that something that's simple, uh, small unit usually, and something that's event driven, it's usually more a function thing. Whereas if you've got some bigger business logic or in particular web front end or something like that, it's probably better as an application on a platform like uh, App Engine. And and if you just zoom on something like uh, the, the scaling aspect, um, 
with a, an application, you have to scale the whole application. Whereas, for example, with a function, you might have like the authentication function for authenticate, authenticating user, users is not used all that much, but perhaps the, the reporting tool that analyzes the, all the cartoons that have been generated, perhaps it's used a lot by the, uh, the salespeople or something like this. And this, th those two functions can scale on their own, uh, at their own for, for their own uh, needs. So let's have a look at a concrete demo. Uh, let's say we have some uh, pictures uh, here, a raccoon, uh, and we are going to uh, invoke a cloud function as soon as the picture is uploaded to Google Cloud Storage. Then we're going to invoke uh, the Cloud Vision API to get some labels. So what's inside that picture? Oh, yes, it's a raccoon uh, that's in that picture. But asynchronously, in parallel, without having to actually uh, synchronize things together or orchestrate things together, you can also have another function which reacts to the very same event. Uh, and this time, it's going to take the picture but create a thumbnail for uh, that little picture and store the thumbnail into cloud storage. And I'll let you show sure. this demo. So let's actually take uh, a look at a live demo of a pretty similar uh, architecture to what Guillaume just talked about. So we are going to live, whoops, um, take a photo. So let's do, well, look at all those like, ah. ah. Okay, I didn't actually start it. <laughs> ah. <laughs> all right, so we'll count it down. Three, two, we'll do something silly. <laughs> all right, that's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> But okay. so let's go ahead and export this this picture, uh, and I'm going to drop it into cloud storage. So we weren't able to get cartoonifying uh, to work in time. Oops. Let me. So you know how it's like hard to use a computer. Oh my goodness, am I holding something down? <laughs> All right, so we're going to use the UI to upload through because <laughs> apparently I'm incapable of dragging and dropping. Um, so similarly, we're going to upload it to cloud storage, and it's going to immediately invoke. Uh, similarly, those two cloud functions, one to do an, an analysis. I have no idea what it's going to say about that image. Uh, and then the other to resize it and do a thumbnail. So let's take a look here. And whoops. Oh, wait, did I upload it to the wrong? Uh, let's try this again because I was in the wrong. I was in the wrong bucket. Yep. Ah, okay. So let's upload it once more. All right. So this is what photo 226. Okay. All right, and now let's look in here, and it should have created a thumbnail. All right, so a very, very tiny, ridiculous version of us. And then we should also get some vision analysis. Let me zoom this in. So we can see product, product. event, <laughs> a recreation. recreation, all right. Fashion here. But most importantly, uh, fun. fun. <laughs> in fact, I'm curious what, what percentage fun 50%. Oof. Oh, so yeah. which half of y'all is having fun? I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> we can do better. Maybe we can do better. So a question I hear a lot is just, should I use serverless? There's a lot of advantages we talked about, right? You're not managing your own infrastructure. You're just caring about your own application code. Um, but it's not always that simple. So should I go serverless to cloud? Yes. See you. See you outside. We'll, we'll get you started. Um, no, just kidding. There are definitely some things to think about before you go serverless. If you have an existing monolithic application, you almost certainly can't just lift and shift it to a serverless technology. Um, instead, if you have an existing app, the best way to approach it is to identify certain pieces of it that would make sense to extract into their own microservice. Either it's something that uh, is looking for, an, uh, is something that you could have respond to an event in a cloud, like a file event or a message coming in, or you can directly invoke it over HTTP. So if you could extract something into a service, um, then that starts to, to let you slowly migrate pieces of your app to a serverless environment. Uh, similarly, though, if you're starting a new a greenfield application, like go nuts. Um, something else to think about if you have long running compute tasks. So right now, cloud functions time out at a maximum of nine minutes. So if you're rendering the next, you know, Pixar um, uh, movie, movie we, you may be using this cool cartoon technology that we uh, totally wrote. Um, it's, it's probably not a good use case, you know, nine minutes as a maximum. Uh, moreover, if you just have long running compute, and this is just true in general, it's generally going to be just cheaper for you to create a virtual machine uh, and just run it for a long time to do some kind of tasks. These are designed to be these quick, ephemeral, they spin up, they run, they spin down type, uh, type of use cases. Uh, similarly, if you need a guaranteed response time, 
Um, this may not be a, a good fit, by which I mean if you need like very consistent performance. So one of the advantages of serverless is that it scales to zero, which means if your functions are not actually running, you don't pay anything, which is, which is great. But it has the sort of drawback that the first request that comes in, it may take a bit to sort of spin everything up to serve that first request. And it's not very long. It's on the order of like a second or two, potentially. But like if you need a sub-second guaranteed response time all the time, uh, you can't necessarily guarantee that. So it's not a cloud function, it's a cold function? A cold function, yeah. So yeah, it's co called a, a cold start, exactly. Um, we do our best and we're you know working to get that better and better, but it's just as right now sort of the reality of the serverless ecosystem. Uh, and then finally, they need to be stateless or ephemeral. We talked a little bit about this earlier, but if you have existing code that just assumes, for example, uh, if I write something to disk, the next time my function gets invoked, that'll be there. It's not necessarily the case. It may or may not be because we're sort of spinning up and spinning down instances as load changes. So if you're going to store state, you need to store it in something like uh, a serverless database or a distributed file system or something like that. And you can cheat a little bit, right? Like if you want to do some kind of like local caching and pre-compute some values and save it, and then the next time your function runs, it just checks, does it exist? Okay, cool. That saves me a bit of time. But if it doesn't, uh, maybe I need to redo it, right? So you can't assume that anything you do in this particular um, execution of this function to like the operating system, quote unquote, will still exist because it might be an entirely different instance. So just kind of some things to think about as you're moving towards a serverless application and a serverless architecture. So that was functions as a service or not yet a service as a service. <laughs> hashtag NASS. Uh, but what's the other kind of serverless? So this is called backend as a service. So backend as a service is kind of that first category we talked about. These are, these are things that you can integrate into your application easily. And so we're going to talk about three of these briefly. Uh, we're going to talk about using Firebase as a database um, and BigQuery as a big serverless, big data analytics warehouse tool, um, and then a conversational tool called Dialogflow. And these are all serverless tools you can plug into your application. So first, I'm going to talk about Firebase. Is anyone using Firebase? A couple. Cool. Has anyone heard of Firebase? Anyone else? Okay. Um, a fair amount. So Firebase is a cross-platform SDK and sort of suite of tools uh, from sorting, supporting Android to iOS to uh, web. There's also a Unity plugin if you're doing things for games. And there's also a C++ if you need to do IoT or embedded devices. So what does Firebase do? Uh, it does all of these things. We're not going to talk a lot about them. Uh, we're not, we're not going to talk about all of them, I mean. Um, we're going to kind of deep dive into one, which is the database specifically. But just to give you a sense of, just to encompass the mindset of backend as a service. These are all things that normally you would have to write for your application. And most people have to write. So sort of that common functionality has been extracted it out and Firebase can provide it to you as a service. Uh, it's great and it gets you up and running to build applications really, really quickly. So like I said, I'm going to focus on one, which is the real-time database. So this is a serverless NoSQL database. Um, it's JSON-based and it's, it's serverless in the sense that it scales for you. You don't have to manage any servers. You literally just sign up uh, and you start interacting with Firebase. But its killer feature, one that's super, super cool, is its real-time synchronization. So if you have an application with multiple users, say on a tablet and a desktop and a phone, and they're all uh, talking to the same database, any change you make in Firebase almost instantaneously will be pushed to all the connected clients. It's really, really powerful. And normally it would take a lot of work. You'd have to set up all the web servers and do web sockets or long polling if it doesn't support it. Um, and so we'll do a quick demo of that here in a second. One thing I like, though, uh, living in New York City, is that uh, it has offline support, specifically for uh, Android and iOS, for mobile devices. And we've probably all been there. You're in the middle of using some app, and you lose connectivity, um, and your app just crashes. It just bombs, because they just assume you have connectivity. Or they have what, what I've heard termed Li-Fi, which is your phone says, yeah, I have connectivity. But like, it does it? Not really. And so it just gets into this weird state. So basically, Firebase will queue up all of these changes you made to the database. And then once it gets connectivity, it'll take care of synchronizing all those up to the cloud. And then any changes that have happened up in the Firebase database while you were offline, it'll then push back down to your device. And it works really, really well. Um, and it's quite powerful. So let's do a quick demo. So here, nope, this is not it. Uh, so it's not a very sexy demo, but it is a demo where I'm going to dynamically change this title uh, where it says Firebase demo. So when a value changes in the Firebase database in the cloud, uh, I want my client to automatically update. So the important thing to notice here is I'm going to do this 
actually with not only not managing any servers, but not writing any server-side code at, at all, zero. So sometimes I like to joke that Firebase is more serverless than serverless because in this case, you're doing everything uh, client-side as far as code. And this is good from the perspective of you want to spend time in your client because that's what the users are interacting with, right? So the better you can make that experience for them, the more time you spend in your client, uh, the better your application is going to be. So just by way of illustration, um, here is literally all of the code uh, of any kind. There, well, there's some uh, connection code in, the, in another file. So this is all JavaScript. And again, it's running in the browser. So I'm just listening to this node called title. Anytime the value changes, it's going to actually fire an event on the client, which I think is a cool like sort of mindset. An, an event is happening in a cloud, and all of your clients get client events sent to them. So let's sort of show this off. Uh, so I've got the Firebase database over here. So anytime this value changes, I want this to happen on the left. But Let's up the stakes a little bit. Let's not actually just have this in one browser. Let's have it in multiple browsers. So we've got uh, Chrome up here on the upper left. We've got Firefox down here. Uh, we've got anyone use Opera? Uh, there's always oh. one guy. Yes. <laughs> Keep the faith, my man. It's coming back. <laughs> it's always someone. Um, and then let's actually just add it up here. Uh, let's do a little fake mobile device. So these are all... Now, these are all like literally running on my workstation, but this is actually all happening over, uh, the, over the internet. So these could just as easily be you on your phone or someone uh, anywhere in the world on their device. So instead of Firebase demo, I will say, hello, DevOx, and, whoops, and then hit enter, and let's see. Awesome. Well, are these... Isn't Firebase awesome, everyone? Huh. Wait a minute. Huh. Well, it worked a second ago. Hold on. Let me make sure there's not a JavaScript. So now we're going to do some live debugging. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, it's, it's still Firebase demo in the, in the database. Let's see if it hadn't been uh, committed or something. Oh, it said something. Oh, yeah, yeah it didn't change. change. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Oh, thank you. I didn't actually notice that. Let's try again. That was on purpose. I was just seeing if anyone was paying attention. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. DevOx? Ha! Uh, well, three out of four ain't bad. Oh. Uh, I don't know. I actually never tried this like the emulator random or... emulator. I installed it today, so hold on. So all of my demos have now <laughs> updated. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I don't know what was up with the emulator, but I think it just got, I think it was the, the machine froze or something. Um, so that's super cool, right? So with changing value eventually um, in, in the cloud, it, it updated and it pushed client events to all of those. And one thing that's Additionally cool, and this is new as of last year, we've actually integrated Cloud Functions, which we just talked about, with Firebase. So we talked about Cloud Functions responding to like file events in the cloud or pub-sub events in the cloud. One of the other events they can do is they can listen for Firebase database change events, which means if I do something like this, like Title 2, I pre-deployed this, um, I will say, greetings, friends, and enemies of serverless. I'll hit enter, and you should see it change instantly. But then a second later, it actually should invoke a cloud function. A second later, remember, oh, and it'll translate it to Spanish, for example. Mm -hmm. Saludos, amigos. Anyone? Is that correct? Is that a good uh, <laughs> translation? Anyone's, in amigos? It seems like too good to be true, but it's a great word otherwise. Um, but it's cool. So again, you can start to see how these cloud functions are sort of the glue that puts everything together because they're being triggered by all of these events. So... Um, let me just back up, go for a second. So there's a bunch of events that in Firebase that Cloud Functions can respond to. So database, which we just saw, authentication events, so as users are signing up for your application. Uh, analytics, which is sort of like, if you know Google Analytics for web, there's Google Analytics for Firebase, which is for like mobile devices. Um, so as users get to certain areas of your app or whatever, you can actually trigger an event in the cloud uh, and the function will run to. And then hosting, which is like a big static C CDN, uh, which is really, really cool. So as requests come in for certain assets, you can have a function that runs. Um, and then I'm not, we don't have time to really get into it, just very briefly. Uh, I want to talk about, so traditionally in Google, we've had three, uh, two databases. We've had Firebase, which is the database that you use if you're building a web or mobile application. And we've had Cloud Data Store, which is the database that you use if you're just sort of running in the cloud. And Cloud Data Store is great because it's, it scales really, really high, has really um, powerful querying abilities. And so we thought, like, wouldn't it be great if we sort of 
semi combined the uh, advantages of both of these products and had like a, a highly scalable, highly queryable database that also was did all this real time syncing. Um, and so just a few weeks ago, actually, we announced Cloud Firestore, uh, which is in beta, which is um, something you should check out if you're interested in. All right. So that's it for yep. Firebase. So you want to talk a little bit about yep. one more back end um, as a service. And I'm actually going to use uh, fi the, the functions from, from Firebase in this example. Uh, Dialogflow, so that's the, uh, the this tool for creating conversational interfaces for you know your chatbots. And there's a functions integration that's been added pretty recently, just uh, you know, a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago. And um, there's in the in the Dialogflow UI, there's actually a new uh, area where you can just like on the cloud console uh, UI, but here in Dialogflow you can actually put the business logic uh, that you need for your chatbot uh, directly uh, within the um, within the, uh, the the Dialogflow console UI. And I'm going to show you that concretely, but I'm going to need a volunteer um, who's ready, who's doing some fitness. So it's going to be, be very fast, but I need someone to step up and Please, be ready. Please, or he's going to make me do to, it. Yeah, otherwise it's going to be a breath. Oh. Yeah. Oh, no. Anyone? So. Well, I shouldn't have said that because now they're like, they want me to do it. Yeah, yeah, now they want you to do it. So where is it? It's here. <laughs> so I have, so this is the volunteer. Yeah, awesome. All right. So I created um, a little here. Uh, so I've got an intern. So people come and I'm going to say hi. We're going to. So I've integrated that with the, the Google Assistant, actually. So the, the, the job <laughs> will be to do some squats for a certain amount of <laughs> seconds. But it's not going to be. It's not, it's not going to be long. Uh, so, OK, let's do some squats. And then for how many seconds? And I'm going to reply. Uh, but the thing is uh, that, OK, uh, is that um, when someone replies, I need to uh, craft a response to prepare the, the training session. And I need some logic for that. So that's why here I've used I've been using the, the cloud functions for Firebase integration. And then I'm creating uh, so I've got a TikTok sound and as many seconds uh, as you have replied, I'm gonna uh, play the TikTok sound. Okay. So I integrated that in the uh, actions on uh, Google here and okay. So Which we should probably, sorry, just point out yeah. that the actions on Google, this is creating custom actions for Google Assistant. Yeah. So if you've seen Google Home, which is like the little, you know, talking candle mm -hmm. thing that we have, um, Google Assistant runs on that via the voice, yeah, or but also runs phone. Yeah, on the phone yeah. and Android Auto in your car, um, exactly. Android Wear and mobile devices. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so let's start. Talk to Squats Master. Okay, here's the test version of Squats Master. Okay, let's do some squats. For how many seconds? How many seconds? 10? Is it okay? 10? Okay, let's do 10. 10 seconds. Ready for 10 seconds of squats? Go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit slow. Thank you so much. <laughs> and you can have Congratulations. stickers. Congratulations. You can have stickers if you want. <laughs> All right. Yes, I showed the code. All right. Uh, here, back in slide mode. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So um, that was one example of using cloud function in non other context uh, using uh, chatbots. And another example I'd like to show you, uh, we mentioned a little bit BigQuery uh, a couple of times already. Uh, imagine an, anal an analytics data warehouse solution. It's very complex to run, to operate, to manage, etc. Uh, but at uh, on Google Cloud Platform, we actually provide a tool called BigQuery, uh, which is a kind of analytics data warehouse as a service manage environment so you don't have to provision anything. And it's able to uh, go through terabytes of data in mere seconds. You're using just a simple SQL syntax. Uh, it, it's interoperable with many uh, languages. And you even have a free quota of one terabyte uh, to, to go through uh, the, the data. So I'm going to do a demo with uh, BigQuery. Oops, I hit again. Up. So it must be here. 
So let's say, uh, have you, and I'm going to look at the, uh, the GitHub archive, uh, which is available as a free uh, data, a public data set on the, uh, through, uh, through BigQuery. So do you know how many Java files there can be on GitHub, all, all, the, all, the, all, the, all the repositories that, uh, that are available on GitHub? Any, any idea? One file, <laughs> one million, one billion? Nobody? Okay. So let's run uh, this little query, a simple SQL query through uh, the, the GitHub data set. So there are 56 million files, Java files, uh, on GitHub. Let's do something more interesting, perhaps the number of repositories with Java files. Uh, any idea if we have 56 million files? Uh, don't be shy. Yeah, 3 million, something like this. So let's see. There are... Three three hundred and eighty-two thousand uh, repositories. Uh, it's it's only open source, you know, uh, project, so it's not your private uh, one. Uh, but that's interesting. And uh, I'd like to finish with one last little query about Maven versus Gradle. So uh, I'm a big fan of Gradle, as you might guess with my Apache Groovy uh, past uh, experience. Um, and uh, we're hearing from the Gradle advocates that, mm, you know, Gradle is uh, um, going to take on Maven and going to be, uh, you know, uh, there's, there are going to be uh, more uh, pro projects, you know, using uh, Gradle versus Maven. So do you think Maven is still ahead or is Gradle already on top of uh, Maven? Gradle ahead? Ah, <laughs> Maven on top? You should okay. ask who's using Who, Gradle. Or who's using Gradle? Oh yeah. yeah, who's using Maven? Oh, okay. Before, so sorry, let's before see. Unit, it's, right now, it's been using our cached uh, results. Um, so if you do show options, yeah, and then un uncached. Okay. So yeah. So talking about serverless, how billing works in BigQuery is it's like how many, what, how much data is it literally uh, querying, and that's what you get billed on. So, oh, what did I do? I oh no. That. Oh no, because I, I removed the. Uh, All right. Uh, Okay, let me do that again. Sorry. Up. And this way we can see how much data it's yeah. actually looking at in this query. So look, so it's going to take a few seconds, but it's going to go through, in a few seconds, <laughs> it's going to go through 173 gigabytes of uh, data in 40 in 40, in 40 doing, in doing wild seconds. card matching no and less. doing yeah. just a you know regular expression on each and, and every uh, uh, wild card matching sorry so yes maven is still ahead but not by such a big margin all right um All right, so just kind of wrapping up, we looked at a bunch of things like what is the ecosystem of serverless, what are some of the tools, what is a backend as a service versus function as a service, or yes, yes not yet a service <laughs> as a service, platforms as a service, um, just kind of how it all fits in and fits together. So I uh, put a couple of use cases that we see people using completely serverless uh, architectures, particularly on Google Cloud using some of our tools. We also have this available at google.cloud.google.com slash serverless if you just want to see what your use case is and what some of the serverless tools are that are available um, to you. So I also want to point out of all the demos that we did just to encompass the spirit of serverless, uh, we didn't manage any servers. We just wrote code. Before we started all these demos today, we were not paying anything. There were no resources provisioned. As soon as we started the demo, whether it was a BigQuery query or a Firebase web load, um, it scaled from zero up. And then once the demo was over, it all scaled back down to zero. So very, very cool. And I think a big sort of paradigm shift in how you build applications. And so kind of to me, it's sort of a parting thought. People ask, like, what does it mean to be a serverless application more than just one particular tool? Um, so a serverless application is just composed of on-demand services and microservices, some of which you write, some of which you just consume, but all of which have invisible infrastructure and you aren't managing any of it at all. So with that being said, here are some resources if you want to learn more about any of the stuff we talked about, or you can reach us on Twitter um, at GLaForge or at Brett MCG. And thank and you very we'll much. We'll be oh. uh, also on the uh, Google Cloud booth so yes. if you want to further uh, you know, discuss with us. And we have stickers. Yeah, and we have stickers. All right, thank Thanks. you.